The harrowing story of benzodiazepine drugs can fittingly begin with this extraordinary icon of hope, the Angel of the North, a sculpture by Anthony Gormley, dramatically adorning Gateshead and Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England. It's a striking image for the home of Professor Heather Ashton, who has become a veritable Angel of the North for those who have suffered and are still suffering from the terrifying nightmare caused by taking benzodiazepines. Valium, Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, and hundreds of others prescribed by their doctors. The many side effects are painful and agonizing and can last for years, perhaps permanently. There's evidence pointing to brain damage, which the drug companies, health agencies, and governments ignore. Professor Ashton is joined by another leading international expert, Professor Malcolm Lader, OBE, in giving exclusive interviews for this documentary helping to expose this disgraceful scandal, which has persisted for over half a century. It's a medical disaster. We have had many before, and we have many again, but at least we can try and rectify that disaster, or at least rectify the effects of that disaster. It is a medical disaster. It's a pandemic, actually. It's like an illness all over the world uh, of overprescription of drugs. And the reason is partly because doctors don't think what they're prescribing, number one. Number two, pushing by the drug companies, number two, and number three, not enough research. At the present moment, we have this large group. We've got to try and set up facilities to help them come off the medication if they should want. We need to develop alternative methods of treatment which don't expose people to pharmacological dangers uh, and we need to compensate them if we've made a mistake. In Newcastle, Professor Ashton set up a clinic for benzodiazepine victims. The drugs are anxiolytic and hypnotic, relieving acute anxiety and insomnia. But disastrously, the actual use has been extended by doctors used as a muscle relaxant and for pains, sports injuries, normal life stresses like bereavement, tinnitus, and in my case, it was for Meniere's disease, an inner ear problem. Despite overwhelming evidence of dangers, doctors, health authorities, and governments have failed to protect citizens from this crime against humanity. Unbelievably, after more than 50 years, new victims worldwide every year are being led by their doctors into this vortex of pain and suffering, completely avoidable if prescribing is sharply curtailed by law and patients by law are clearly and strongly warned of the dangers. This was a real, and still is, a real tragedy. As I say, people lose their jobs, their income, their, their relationships, their marriages. What we need, I think, is you know, some, a wake-up call uh, where we find people who are showing signs of brain damage, even if it's just functionally to start with, and that this would um, act as a catalyst. Drug companies now do list a lot of side effects, but what they don't tell you is that for a significant number of benzodiazepine sufferers, potentially millions worldwide over half a century, the symptoms, particularly the physical and painful, do not go away and can be crippling for years. In some cases, I think you suggested it was uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, of those suffering from uh, withdrawal symptoms. Uh, they have protracted withdrawal symptoms. The, the symptoms go on for longer than a year and sometimes for years and possibly even permanently. Yes, uh, that's only an estimate, though. Um, there were some who didn't um, uh, seem to recover fully, but most of them lost their anxiety. But there were people who still had muscle pains, muscle spasms, mostly physical things, actually. But they'd lost their anxiety and depression and um, nightmares and all those. Uh, the mental systems went, but the physical symptoms tended to be long term. Yes, now this is even more contentious, what we call the persistent withdrawal syndrome. And we described that, and so did Heather Ashton, many years ago, and we were concerned about this. Now I laid down quite firm criteria. I said that this would have to be 
a condition in which somebody stopped the medication, developed a withdrawal syndrome with the symptoms I've just mentioned, but those symptoms persisted. I didn't see this coming on as a separate uh, syndrome later with a gap of uh, symptom-free, but there are variations on this. Some people do get permanent, uh, what feels like permanent sy symptoms. We don't know the causes of them. Nobody's ever looked at them. Uh, so we just need to do some research on that, but we haven't. As you know, I myself am suffering from long-term uh, side effects of benzodiazepines. Uh, it means that uh, I can't walk very much. In some cases, I can't walk at all. Uh, I'm suffering from electric currents running through my body, also electric shocks. Is that common? Have you come across those kind uh, of symptoms uh, in your work? Well, yes, I have, certainly. And they are, those ones do seem to be protracted. And the interesting thing is, in this age where everybody's having antidepressants now, SSRIs like Prozac, they can produce similar symptoms, including this electricity feeling. Um, and one wonders that if we ever get rid of benzos, whether another lot of drugs won't <laughs> take over and be just as bad. Um, certainly the, some of the short-acting Prozac-like drugs are and yes, I've had patients with sort of explosive headaches as if there's an electric current running up and boom, like a thunderclap in the rain, yes. There were also cases presenting, weren't there, of people whose symptoms didn't go away. They suffer a withdrawal syndrome and the symptoms can be prolonged, go on for a year and possibly even permanently. Yes, I still get emails quite frequently from people from all over the world saying that they have been withdrawn from their tranquilizer or their sleeping tablet, from their Valium, their Ativan, their Clonopin, whatever, and they developed symptoms and those symptoms have persisted. They're usually a little less, but they may not have gone away after several years. In Britain alone, it's estimated that up to one and a half million people are on long-term prescription of benzodiazepines. Many are probably frightened to stop because of the appalling side effects. And even while taking the drugs, they can suffer withdrawal illness from tolerance. An important study recently shows that long-term users have a 50% increased risk of Alzheimer's. The serious long-term harm caused by benzodiazepines is compared to the infamous thalidomide scandal. These protracted or permanent side effects uh, of benzodiazepines uh, have never been fully investigated. A prominent victim, Colm Downs Granger, uh, has said that this is a scandal like thalidomide. Yes, you could compare it to thalidomide. Uh, it is more common, probably, and uh, the health service and the government and to some extent the doctors that ignored it, yes. Uh, and certainly it, it, um, it was a tragedy as bad, it still is, as thalidomide. But it's, as you say, it's hidden because people say, oh, you look well, but they don't know what you're feeling like inside. Do you think uh, Hoffman LaRoche has a responsibility, a moral responsibility in this area? Whether they have a moral responsibility, of course, uh, is a different matter. I'm not a moral philosopher. Um, I would hope that they would take some responsibilities seriously and out of their past profits uh, finance some um, useful um, studies. Essentially, they need to start with an epidemiological study. That is, you need to look, seeing what's going on out there in real life, how many people starting on medications of this type and are running into trouble. That can be done because uh, we have research organisations uh, which monitor medication and can be tapped into to see what the outcomes are. In the 1980s, you told the BBC that uh, withdrawing from benzodiazepines was much more difficult than withdrawing from heroin. Yes, that's true. And I would often, in uh, <coughs> collaboration with some colleagues, take people who had addiction problems 
with the benzodiazepines, but also addiction problems with heroin or cocaine or whatever, amphetamines. Uh, and we found that uh, it was actually easier for people to withdraw from heroin um, with help uh, than it was for them to come off the benzodiazepines. What was the response to those remarks? Oh, I think it was just <coughs> generally disbelief. Everybody thinks it's very difficult to get off heroin. Yet people are doing it all the time. They're admitted to uh, uh, prison and they go even go cold turkey, but they're usually there's some help. Um, so it's not that difficult to come off heroin. Um, benzodiazepines can be much more uh, of a problem, particularly in the minority, which uh, I've mentioned, that um, have uh, severe withdrawal reactions and may become persistent. And you referred in your recent paper that you've written about benzodiazepines, you referred to um, those people suffering an agony. Is that the way it appeared to you when you were listening to case histories being described to you? Um, because people do say it's like going through hell, and I experienced this myself. Yes, I think that's so. I think the people who are getting a severe reaction, the symptoms are so complex, they're so diffuse, so persistent, they're so interfering with day-to-day -day life that they are uh, an agony. But I emphasize that most people don't get to that degree of severity. But Professor Lader and others say that the minority who can have a severe reaction could be up to 30%. The symptoms are myriad. In her clinic, Professor Ashton recorded the many distressing conditions. Pain, limbs, back and neck. Pain, teeth and jaw. Paresthesia, stabbing pins and needles. Limbs and face. Stiffness, limbs, back and jaw. Tremor, muscle pain, twitches, dizziness, tinnitus, hypersensitivity to sound, light, touch and taste. Fits, seizures, anxiety, depression, poor memory and concentration. Insomnia, nightmares, hallucinations, agoraphobia and other phobias. Panic attacks and palpitations, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation. All patients complained of difficulty walking. This appeared to result from a combination of sensory disturbance, muscle weakness, pain and stiffness. Pain in various parts of the body was prominent. Neck pain and occipital headache, pain in the limbs described as aching, bursting, cutting, were all common and often severe. Paresthesiae. All patients had feelings of pins and needles, tingling, crawling in the skin, numbness or altered sensation at some time, usually affecting the limbs in a glove and stocking distribution. As the eminent Irish expert Dr John O'Connor says about benzodiazepine withdrawal, the body becomes its own personal torture chamber. Ironically, benzodiazepines replaced the dangerous barbiturates. There was the move to the benzodiazepines, which seemed safer in overdose and also didn't seem to produce the same addiction problems and they became very popular indeed. Names like Mother's Little Helper and doctors were prescribing them very widely and I think indiscriminately. So they thought, well, um, benzodiazepines don't kill anybody so we can give them with absolute certitude they'll be safe. But they didn't think that they might be addictive or and have other characteristics because they worked exactly very similarly to barbiturates. I wrote a textbook about that time in the 1960s and I went back to have a look at what I said and I was urging caution there. I just didn't believe these ideas that somehow the benzodiazepines were totally safe. So the companies obviously didn't research these drugs thoroughly enough um, before they went on the market. Why do you think that is? Well, we have to remember this went on in the 1950s. The marketing was in the 1960s. And the requirements at those days were much more lax than they are now. Sometimes wonder whether Valium could have even been licensed now. But certainly in those days, much easier to do. And it was only literally a few weeks or months 
from first giving it to man for it to be available on the market. So it, it was a very rapid development and certainly uh, it wasn't a thorough development. To what extent did benzodiazepines become a huge success for Hoffman La Roche, uh, the drug company which first introduced them? Well, Labrium and, and Valium um, were enormously successful and Valium actually became the most uh, prescribed drug in the whole world. Yes, that's so. Uh, at one point it was worldwide and I think also in the United States by itself, it was the um, most widely prescribed and profitable any drug on the market. Can you understand why uh, they were considered almost a panacea for all kinds of life problems that people had? Well, they were considered a panacea. It wasn't almost a panacea. They were considered a panacea. And the, if you look at the adverts at the time, they, the pharmaceutical companies were advocating their use in any sort of situation. And you know, we have this phrase, the worried well. These are people who don't have full-blown psychiatric or psychological problems. They're just concerned about things in general, usual stresses of day-to-day -day life. And they were being urged to take the Valium and its other compounds. And they had advertised uh, and paid for um, conferences and all sorts of things. That, and they had um, reps who used to come down round to every GP practice give them free presents and all that. And um, so that they, they were pushed. And the doctors, of course, were very willing to have a safer drug. And they just didn't think what it might be doing. Although it seemed to me it was perfectly obvious. Can you describe in simple terms what is happening in our brains with these psychoactive drugs? Well, uh, <clears throat> the benzodiazepines enhance the actions of a an important neurotransmitter, that's a chemical in the brain, uh, that normally has an inhibitory or calming effect. And so the way they work initially is very clever uh, because they just give you, they up this effect of calming all over the brain. So they relieve tension, they affect balance, like alcohol, and they affect thinking and sensations and brain function everywhere. And then, uh, but the body is much cleverer than people think because it says, hey, there's, uh, there's a, a foreign body here, a thing called a benzo. Um, I'm going to adapt to it. And so they downregulate these receptors. And in the end, uh, it's, the drug doesn't work anymore because they've, take, they've stopped this enhancement. And so the patient starts to get withdrawal symptoms saying, hey, I need some more of that stuff. So very often the dose has to be escalated to get the same effect. And if it isn't, people get what are withdrawal symptoms, even though they're on the same dose. Is that common? Have you come across those suffering from uh, withdrawal symptoms? And of course, if you are suffering withdrawal symptoms before you have stopped taking benzodiazepines and then you want to stop taking benzodiazepines so that you can recover, you're obviously going to go through a really horrible time. Yeah. Torrid time while you're getting there, uh, stopping taking benzodiazepines. Well, it gets worse unless you do it very, very gradually. And this is, again, what, uh, what the um, Goethe detox is. Uh, they've got lots of detox players in America. They take you off quickly. Well, that's hopeless because it doesn't give you time to get the equilibrium to swing back. You can't do that quickly. So we shouldn't be interfering with this evolutionary process in the brain. We do so at our peril. I think so, yes, I'm, I'm sure. So it's taken millions of years to get such a good organ, a good instrument as we've got in our heads. And if we mess it up, it's just stupid, really. After over 50 years, benzodiazepines are still prescribed carelessly, negligently and inappropriately. Roche discovered and launched the first, Librium, in 1960, and then ignored a grim warning about its dangers two years before selling Valium. Professor Lader takes up the story of the man who discovered benzodiazepines. A man called Leo Sternbach, who 
uh, was Polish, and in the 1930s he was working for Roche uh, and was synthesizing various compounds and examining them for effect on the body and the brain. He didn't find a great deal, so he stopped working on them. And then when the problems, the Nazis came into power, uh, Roche were taking their Jewish uh, staff, and Leo Sternbach was Jewish, uh, out of Europe and uh, relocating them in the United States. So Leo Sternbach went to the United States and looking for something to do, he picked up these compounds again and uh, tried various substitutions in them. They were quite complex. And then eventually discovered a compound which he called metamino diazepoxide, a long name which then changed to chlordiase epoxide, and we know it better as Librium. And he established its effect in animals and then uh, quickly in humans and uh, decided they had a very good tranquilizer and it became very popular very quickly indeed. But there was some research done on Librium even before Valium was developed in 1961 by a man called Hollister. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, yes, I knew Leo Hollister. He was, uh, uh, I think he's dead now, but he was um, concerned about, the, about Librium. He was concerned that he didn't believe it was devoid of addiction properties. And he did a study, which I suppose now we would regard as unethical, where he practically forced fed Librium to some uh, inmates in a prison in the United States. And they became addicted. And then he stopped it. And uh, there were major side, major problems, major side effects. I think one or two of them actually had epileptic fits. Uh, and he warned that this was going to be a problem in the future. And that was 1961, and 1961. they'd just been on the drugs for two months? They'd been on for two months. This was 1961, and the paper was published in a journal called Psychopharmacology. When did you begin to have really serious concerns uh, that benzodiazepines were actually causing real problems for people? The late 1970s, early 1980s. Well, I had two concerns. The first concern was the extent of prescription. I felt that this could not reflect definite psychiatric illness in the population. This was over-prescription and there was going to be a price to pay for that. So that was my first concern. And in fact, I wrote a, a paper called um, Benzodiazepines, Tranquilizers, the Opium of the Masses. And one of my colleagues wrote a paper called the Benzodiazepine Bonanza. So our first concern was the overprescription. And then as time went on and we did further studies, it became clear that there was also dependence at therapeutic doses. And this surprised us. This wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. And trying to get the medical profession uh, to accept this has been really a 40-year task. My symptoms have been a disabling sentence for eight years now. There's painful difficulty walking and standing, severe stabbing pains with the sensation of electric currents passing around my body, head and neck pains, tremors, abdominal pain, and more. After taking Valium for a short time prescribed for Menier's disease, an inner ear disorder, these symptoms started and have never stopped. Within six months, I had to stop working. It was the beginning of a real living nightmare which came close to costing me my life and there was nowhere to go like Professor Ashton's clinic in Newcastle. Why did you establish your clinic dealing with uh, benzodiazepines in the first place? People taking the benzodiazepines, many of them by that time had taken it long term, uh, years and years. I mean, I've seen people who've been on it for 20 years or more. And they realized that after a while the drugs didn't work anymore. And not only that, they were getting iller. And the patients that were referred to me and, uh, were referred by the doctor because they said, look, there's something wrong with these drugs. I'm getting worse instead of better. 
we were uh, interested in the effects uh, long term of benzodiazepines and also we were running a clinic here for people and we were getting increasing number of referrals for people who said they could not come off the benzodiazepines because of a variety of symptoms. Uh, we discussed this and assumed that they had uh, pushed the dose up. They hadn't. So this is how we first got the idea of normal dose iatrogenic dependence. What people said when they tried to stop was really firstly that their anxiety or their insomnia or their tensions came back and were worse. But also they got new symptoms and these were particularly perceptual symptoms as we call them so that you got people saying that um, sounds were very loud that lights were very bright, that they felt unsteady, uh, that they had pains uh, and uh, ringing in the ears and things of that sort. But in the 1980s there was first a trickle and then a stream and finally a river of people all wanting to get off the benzodiazepines and that's how it started uh, and it fell to me because I was interested in what was causing this. That, um, that I got involved in it. What kind of symptoms were people suffering from when they came to your clinic? Well, all sorts of things. Um, they were very, very anxious, all of them. And I think that's what, or most of them, put off the doctors. And they, have, they couldn't sleep, and they got nightmares and dreams, and they were jittery, and some of them had a tremor. They developed agoraphobia, social phobias, some of them paranoid, some of them very um, uh, angry, sort of rage, and with sensory disturbances, so that um, light seemed too bright, the room walls seemed to be sloping, you know, all these sort of strange things. Some of them were afraid they were going mad, and um, sounds too bright, and tinnitus, their ears ringing, and all sorts of things. And in addition to that, tremors and um, muscle spasms, patches of numbness, muscle pains, muscle jerks, uh, a whole host of symptoms, both physical and mental. And um, But I had patients who'd been told they had multiple sclerosis and were doomed for life. And you got them off the benzos and the symptoms <laughs> disappeared. So, you, you know, it became clear it was due to the drugs. We had one or two cases where people had epileptic fits, which you might expect, and of course that harks back to Hollister's study. But by and large, it was just this terrible uh, hypersensitivity and also a general feeling of being very unwell, not functioning properly. If you stop benzo suddenly, uh, you get fits and it can kill you, uh, incidentally. Uh, so that's why you have to withdraw slowly. Some of these symptoms were really terrifying for the people suffering them. Uh, and in some cases, people were actually becoming disabled. Isn't that the case? Oh, it certainly was. I mean, because these symptoms could be quite overwhelming, were very severe. Um, there were even suicides. People got very depressed. And um, led to the breakup of families, marriages, leading, you became impossible to work, you lost your job, you lost your income very often, uh, and uh, also it was difficult to get any um, compensation because nobody realised it was a real illness. Professor Lader has described this as a medical disaster, would you agree? Yeah, th this was a real, and still is, a real tragedy. Uh, but just to be clear on the issue, um, you say that at the same time not very many facilities were being pro provided around the country to look after these people uh, and these people were measured in hundreds of thousands, millions? Well we think uh, from the GP studies uh, at least millions in the country and so the patients themselves usually s started setting up their own support groups. And it was they, and still is, <laughs> support groups who get more people off and give them more support. 
than any doctor because uh, there are no NHS clinics now. One of the difficulties in getting people to focus on the dangers of benzodiazepines appears to be the fact that some people can get off the drugs relatively easy while others suffer terrible agony. Yes, and the, the point is that if we could predict who is going to withdraw easily and who is going to go through agonies, we could reserve the benzodiazepines, which do have some positive effects, just for those who are not going to run into problems. But we can't predict, and therefore you have to look at the totality of the distress that is caused. In 2010, Britain's independent newspaper opened up another very disturbing chapter of the story, revealing documents from the British Medical Research Council, officially kept secret for nearly 30 years, about Professor Lader's attempt to get potential brain damage from the drugs properly investigated. That long ago, he'd carried out two studies of patient brains, which showed worrying abnormalities. Well, we knew that alcohol, that had been well researched, taken chronically in high dose, abuse in other words, can cause subtle brain damage, which is only partly reversible. I always had to lurk in the back of my mind that these people are taking their benzodiazepines for many years, decades. Maybe it's having an effect on the brain as well. So we used the uh, imaging techniques available at the time and looked at a group of patients who hadn't abused alcohol but had been on benzodiazepines for a long time. And we found some anomalies, some abnormalities which concerned us. And we thought, view the extent of usage of these benzodiazepines. There are millions of people, literally, who might be at risk, and we needed to go into this in more detail. Uh, so we, I asked for the Medical Research Council to look into this, and they agreed and set up this uh, subcommittee, which met, and we looked at the evidence. A report went to the Neurosciences Board of the Medical Research Council, but nothing further was done about it. Can you understand why the results of that meeting, the record of that meeting, uh, was kept secret for three decades? Well, it wasn't secret in the sense that we weren't uh, adjured to secrecy. There was no official Secrets Act. And I was very surprised to find out later that those minutes hadn't been released. So I don't know what was, what was going on, but there was concern about it. And I know that uh, I think Professor Heather Ashton, and I'm sure you'll ask her that, she also put forward a proposal which was turned down. Both you and Professor Lader put research proposals to the Medical Research Council. He wanted to investigate um, some prima facie evidence he had of structural damage to the brain from uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, you wanted to follow up um, uh, with a research group based on well, your clinic and a proposal to put yes. to the Medical Research Council for a, a very authoritative study, and they turned down that I as well. We never got money for it. I had a very good um, sample of people because I had 300 patients at my clinic who had followed for several years. I knew all their brothers, sisters, spouses, you know, people who'd had a similar upbringing so that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't say, oh, well, it, you know, you, you're not select, you've got a selective group. And so people, who, 300 who were on benzos, 300 relatives or spouses who weren't, we could have done MRIs, we uh, studies on that for structural things. We could have done a lot of um, cognitive tests to see if they were impaired because something I haven't mentioned, which is perhaps the greatest tragedy of all, is when people are on benzos, they are, um, their thinking is impaired and they're prone to traffic accidents, making bad decisions, all sorts of things, poor memory. and. Um, so we, we could have looked for that, to see if that recovers. Um, and other th things with um, looking at brain function with uh, things like EEG and magnetoencephalography as well, which are ways of looking at actual, the way the neurons in the brain are firing. We could have done all that on a large number of patients. And I tried the MRC and the Wellcome Research Council and 
Medical Research Council and the Wellcome never got the money for it. I don't think it was considered as a serious enough condition. I don't know why, but... It... In Newcastle, Professor Ashton wrote her now famous manual on benzodiazepines, describing the symptoms and showing how to withdraw slowly. It's free on the internet. A book could have made her a fortune. It's the Bible worldwide for victims of doctor-induced benzodiazepine illness. Professor Ashton became a medical advisor and friend to victims everywhere. This is a bound volume of some of the thousands of letters and emails she's received from all over the world, made by a grateful patient. The consultant who recommended I take Valium for Meniere's disease brushed aside my concern, saying it was a most malign drug that could be a preventative against Meniere's attacks. He stopped prescribing Valium for Meniere's now, a lesson learned at a huge cost to me. When I started getting darting pains in my legs, I searched the web and in shock found the Ashton Manual, which explained what was happening to me. You wrote the Ashton Manual, which was published on the web. It's about benzodiazepines, how they work, and also about how to withdraw from uh, benzodiazepines. Why did you do that? Was it in response to a very big need? Well, yes, uh, because the patients seemed to know more than the doctors. They, all of them said the reason they'd come here was they got no help from their GP or from a psychiatrist. I had patients referred from psychiatrists even. And they, the patients seemed to know better than the doctors. And so I wrote that manual for patients who couldn't get help from their doctors. It was for them. And the interesting thing is, although patients all over the world have snapped it up, the doctors still don't read it. Actually, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that um, the, in all the literature telling you how to prescribe drugs, they all say that benzodiazepines are for short-term use only, uh, two to four weeks maximum. And even the company that makes them says that, but it's just that nobody takes any notice. How many languages is it translated into now? Uh, well, it's over 12. Over, over 12. <laughs> there's, there's a Japanese one. Uh, there's all the all European languages. It has been used by literally millions of people all, well, all over I the world. I presume so, yes. Uh, I mean, if you look at the prescription levels, uh, interestingly, Japan has the highest in the world <laughs> prescription levels at the moment of benzodiazepines. And th they're lapping it up. And, you know, all these things have been translated by people um, voluntarily. I mean, they've never been paid for it or, or anything like that. In the United States, the National Institutes for Health report in this bar chart that drug overdose deaths involving benzodiazepines have risen sharply over the past 13 years, going from over 1,000 in 2001 to about 8,000 in 2014. Meanwhile, in December 2015, the American Public Health Association has warned that both benzodiazepine prescriptions and quantities prescribed have increased considerably. Interventions, they say, are needed to reduce the use of benzodiazepines or improve their safety. The state of Massachusetts is considering a new law to strictly limit and control prescription, requiring detailed warnings by both doctors and chemists, with black box warnings on benzodiazepines like cigarettes. Suicides uh, have taken place yes. uh, with people trying suffering withdrawal symptoms maybe while they're still taking uh, yes. the drug or alternatively going through this terrifying period where they're reducing and stopping. Is that common? Have you come across those kind uh, of suicides? It, it is very disturbing and there have been suicides. You, you think, can't cope with this anymore. I suppose suicide is a possible outcome. I think it's more of it is maybe hidden because people don't try and come off the medication, don't come off the tranquilizers. They think it's helping them and they go on and in fact they, they go to the grave with a bottle of tablets beside them. I think it's that, that's where the hidden amount is. It's you don't know that you've got problems until you try and stop. Also that they cause depression. You know, what with pain and depression and anxiety and the whole lot, 
what is there to live for? Your marriage is broken down. I mean, it's not very high, but there have, and I don't think anybody's counted it either. But there have been suicides, usually in withdrawal, but sometimes um, when you're still taking them. But the numbers might be, they might be bigger than people think because these would be hidden as well. It's it, po quite possible that they wouldn't be reported uh, as suicides. Well, they, see, benzodiazepines are implicated in, in the big suicide studies. Most people, if they're going to commit suicide, they take a big drink, they take an antidepressant, they take a benzo, you know, they take a whole lot. And the one thing about benzos that made them so safe was that they didn't stop your breathing, they didn't depress respiration, uh, like barbiturates do. But if you mix them with other drugs, painkillers, or that you also painkillers or antidepressants or other drugs that depress respiration, the additive effect can kill you. So whether they cause it or not, we don't know. But you can be suicidal just on a benzodiazepine alone. Cruel reality intervened in April 2016 when 49-year-old building conservationist Paul Rayner from Somerset took his own life 10 months into a painful withdrawal after stopping the benzodiazepine clonazepam, also known as clonopin. Paul had to give up his job, which he loved. Here he's working on Truro Cathedral, Paul's side effects were shocking. His former partner and close friend, Brooke Fenton Hale, describes how he lost his sharp mental skills and felt his brain crashing against his skull, shaking and vibrating every day. He had pains and vibrations in his legs and body. He suffered tinnitus and nightmares. In the shower, the water hit his skin like needles. He spent days lying on a bed or a sofa, a far cry from the happy young man with his first daughter, Alice. He couldn't earn a living and he couldn't take the physical or mental pain any longer. His mother, Janet Rayner, a former nurse, is very angry about what legal medications did to her son. National Health Service figures for drug poisonings in England in 2014 show that benzodiazepines far exceed illegal drugs. There were 15,385 benzodiazepine cases compared to 2,450 for heroin, 2,306 for cocaine and 739 for cannabis. Where death is involved, heroin and morphine top the figures in England and Wales combined, but benzodiazepines are in third place. The 372 deaths in 2014 were an 8% annual increase and the highest benzodiazepine mortality rate since records began in 1993. Diazepam, the generic drug in Valium, was used in 258 cases, the highest number on record according to the National Statistical Bulletin. Other drugs were usually involved as well, as Professor Ashton said. So, with such dangerous drugs being widely prescribed, is there a moral responsibility for the drug companies to properly research this disaster? Well, dr drug companies are a business. And when we, medic many medical students do actually go into drug companies, they've got far more facilities than these. And we always used to say, oh, you're going to sell your soul. They do sell their souls. And the drug companies are there to make money. I don't think they have any more scruples than tobacco companies, which are already making a great fuss about smoking. And the drink drinking uh, uh, industry, they're all making a terrible fuss if anybody tries to stop them. So I don't think drug companies would fund it. Yes, the problem is that most of these tranquilizant sleeping tablets are out of patent which means that there's no um, profit left in the uh, drugs. Now, the only financial incentive which would come would be if there's a lot of medical legal cases uh, which uh, develop so that people are beginning to sue uh, because they've gone through a withdrawal reaction. But there are cases now which are coming through. Now, I predict that if those cases are successful, and so far they really haven't come to court, 
we will find that the um, doctors' organizations will start to issue warnings that long-term prescription is not acceptable. This is what we call ex-label prescribing. In other words, it's not covered by the license which the medication is given when it is authorized. So I think that might be a development, that there will be a tightening up, but it will be imposed on the medical profession by the legal profession. Lawyers are looking for personal injury cases, and if they can tap into this, get a few um, cases in which the judge is on the uh, claimant's side, that is the patient's side, you could open floodgates of everybody who has been on medication beyond the licensed month or whatever, uh, threatening to sue their general practitioners. And that again, I think, or the National Health Service, of course, that again, I think, would be uh, a major development. But I don't see many signs of that. It's, there's starting to be cracks in the dam, but they're not large yet. But they are suing successfully. In 2015, Luke Montague, heir to Lord Sandwich, got £1.3 million sterling in damages and costs in a benzodiazepine case. There was inappropriate rapid withdrawal and misprescribing of the benzodiazepine clonazepam, causing him many painful symptoms and costing him his job. He's now a campaigner on the issue of prescribed drug dependence and a founder of the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. His traumatic story was reported by the Sunday Times. His lawyer, Caroline Moore, a director of UK legal firm Medical Solicitors, has secured damages for many such clients, depending on the severity of the benzodiazepine harm and income losses. You want to see proper research done into the possibility of brain damage uh, after the evidence that you compiled in the early 1980s. Um, is it going to be possible to do that kind of research now with techniques that will make it clear whether or not this is true? Well, they'd be much better than the rather crude techniques we used many years ago when you know we just had these um, brain imaging techniques um, being available. But this kind of research you feel should be done, if it's not going to be done by the drug companies, should it be done by the government? Well, I think it should, uh, but you know, we're fought this battle years ago, and, and I think there are other people who would, could, could look at this. Um, what we need, I think, is you know, some, a wake-up call uh, where we find people who are showing signs of brain damage, even if it's just functionally to start with, and that this would um, act as a catalyst to persuade the um, research organisations, the government research organisations, to provide the appropriate money. Can we look now at the possibility of long-term brain damage caused by benzodiazepines? Uh, in your view, uh, is this possible? And uh, if it is possible, are there ways and techniques available now today, research techniques, which could prove or disprove this? Yes, one could certainly these days with modern techniques. Uh, uh, people have told me you could easily tell in animals whether the receptors of benzodiazepines change um, if you feed them uh, benzos for a long time and whether it comes back. So you never, some don't come back to normal. So your nervous system can't function as normal. So y you say that there are these research techniques now which would be very good at illustrating if there's a change long-term changes in the functions uh, of brains as a result yes. of taking them now. We could. In a recent medical article that you've written about benzodiazepines, you said this problem has persisted for 50 years, but has been largely ignored by doctors, by consultants, by official bodies. That's a pretty damning statement, isn't it? Why do you think that is? I don't know. Why would the uh, minutes of that MRC subcommittee embargoed. I, see, I can see no scientific reason for it. 
I'm not going into a sort of conspiracy theory, but <laughs> it's very difficult to avoid wondering what is actually going on here. But you also said uh, to the Sunday Independent that you regretted that you didn't push the, the issue more actively. Yes, I do regret it. I mean, I felt I, perhaps I should have done, but um, it, there are times when it's rather nice to stop banging your head against the wall. A penetrating light has been shone on the darkness hiding the benzodiazepine disaster by Professor Ashton and Professor Lader. Ironically, those who voluntarily take illegal drugs get substantial medical resources from our societies, while victims of doctor-induced illness from prescribed drugs often get little informed state help. The legal pharma industry can and has done much good, making drugs that save lives and alleviate illness. But there's no excuse for the scandalous neglect of this pandemic of life-destroying pain and suffering benzodiazepines have caused and continue to cause today. There's no excuse now either for the ignorance or negligence of the medical profession who often wrongly prescribe them. Governments and health authorities have shamefully failed their societies, pandering to big pharma because of their economic muscle. Academic researchers too must recognize they have a social responsibility to investigate this disaster. It's long past time that these actors faced up to the truth about these drugs and started doing something about it. <laughs> <laughs>